Good afternoon, everyone. It's really exciting to be here today. Uh, today, we are going to talk about building a batch processing platform on top of uh, multi-cluster Kubernetes and Argo workflows at infinite scale. Right? We have around uh, 40 to 50K pipelines uh, uh, at the metadata level itself, which has uh, 100K or uh, 2,000 K uh, concurrent execution. So let's talk a little bit about it. So here is a quick introduction about ourselves. So my name is Arum Malikel. I'm a group manager at Intuit. Uh, and I'm responsible for building the next generation batch processing capabilities along with scheduling and orchestration. And with me today, Rakesh Suresh, who is the lead engineer on building these platform capabilities. So here is a quick agenda. We will be talking a little bit about uh, Intuit background. And I'll be talking a little bit about the platform overview, and Dakesh will be actually doing a deep dive into the platform architecture and some of the operational excellence and observability challenges we faced and how did we actually solve them, and a quick demo if we have time. So <clears throat> before we actually deep dive into the platform, uh, a quick shout out to Intuit. So we are a global technology platform that helps you to achieve financial confidence, right? We are a purpose-driven, value-driven company. Our mission is to power prosperity around the world with our flagship product, which is TurboTax, QuickBooks Online, um, MailChimp, and uh, uh, Credit Karma. So next is about uh, batch processing platform overview. So here is some of the personas, use cases which you are solving. As a ML engineer, I want to actually build and iterate on models faster and uh, um, more models uh, and features faster. As a data analyst, I want to actually provide insights to the business as quickly as possible. As a data engineer or as a software engineer, I want to produce clean data and I want to manage and run uh, reliable pipelines. And these are some of the indirect uh, customers who uh, their use cases we are solving. So now let's discuss a little bit about uh, the core platform capabilities. There are, there are main four platform capabilities we are providing. One is the runtime scheduling and orchestration capability. The second one is the DevOps tooling. The third one is governance. And fourth one is the service level management. So I'll be walking us through all the four capabilities in detail. So in uh, runtime scheduling and orchestration capabilities, as part of this platform, we are providing four different runtime capabilities. One is the Spark on Kubernetes, and the second one is EMR, the third one is Databricks, and uh, the fourth one is the Docker container. What, what is more interesting is all these computes are fully managed. That means the developers doesn't need to worry about uh, touching the hardware or doesn't need to worry about uh, managing this infrastructure at all. Right? And we provide the capability to switch between these runtimes, any of these runtimes, based on their requirements. It can be due to the, either the performance reason or the cost reasons. They have the option to switch between the runtimes with a few clicks on their pipeline. Uh, and along with all these uh, Spark runtimes and the Docker runtimes, so we provide uh, advanced intuitive scheduling and orchestration capabilities also. That means as a developer, you don't need to learn any scheduling or orchestration tool. It's a, a low-code solution. You can actually go and actually build your own data pipeline with a few clicks. The next one is uh, DevOps tooling. All these pipelines are CACD enabled, which is built on top of Argo CD. And we provide a managed infrastructure. And uh, we, are a, we are fully cloud-enabled company. We, as a developer, they need to actually work with uh, a lot of uh, cloud resources. Right? So they need to learn, how, if they want to do the policy configuration, they need to learn about different kinds of cloud resources, but we provide an intuitive way of uh, sh uh, configuring their policies. And automated provisioning, because the platform does uh, the provisioning for them, they don't need to worry about it. And alerting monitoring is uh, inbuilt capabilities from the platform. The developer doesn't, as a ML engineer or as a, a data engineer, they don't need to actually worry about uh, either infrastructure or setting the their monitoring or uh, alerting capabilities. The next one is uh, asset lifecycle management and the developer velocity. So we measure the developer velocity also for those data pipelines. The teams doesn't need to worry about uh, setting up their own way of uh, measuring their velocities. So the next one is the governance. So Intuit is uh, one of the leading fintech companies. So we are part of a lot of compliance and security requirements. So compliance is very important for us. So 
As part of uh, this capability, we have tied along with Intuit authentication and authorization schemas. Also, we have custom uh, approved uh, workflows for compliance, SOX compliance or other compliance pipelines. We do provide change management capabilities and we do provide uh, versioning capabilities for all the data pipelines. In case, uh, uh, if the developer finds that, okay, so he wants to run some of the pipelines which was running fine uh, yesterday, they have the option to roll back to the previous version of the pipeline. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the service level management. This is a highly available platform. We provide four nights of availability, and we run some of the tight SLA use cases, right? Some of the use cases which we run on this platform has uh, two minutes SLA use cases end to end. And we do provide cost insight between different kinds of Spark runtimes that enables the user to actually choose what runtime is suitable for their use cases rather than just one solution. And we provide paved path. What does this mean is it's a low-code, uh, uh, no-code solution which actually enable a developer to create a data pipeline with a few clicks. Earlier, uh, setting up a production pipeline was taking probably a few days or probably one or two weeks. Now, a newly joined engineer at Intuit can actually productionize a pipeline probably in um, probably less than 15 minutes, right? So he will be having a production pipeline running with uh, monitoring uh, alerting capabilities uh, with uh, all the scheduling and orchestration capabilities. Even uh, he can actually set up a um, different uh, compliance data pipeline also. The next one is the shared process. This is a core capabilities. I believe uh, Rakesh will be talking a little bit more about shared capabilities. What this uh, shared processor means, uh, the, we actually uh, onboard a lot of platform and pl platform on platform use cases. For example, ML platform can actually onboard to this platform to actually trigger a workflow on the ML platform, right? So a Kubeflow workflow can be triggered uh, based on the shared processing capabilities on a ML infrastructure. So here is a quick glance of all the capabilities. It's like 30,000 view of our capabilities. So, but this is just a very high level view. There are a lot of additional features which we provide. I want to touch up a little bit about one specific runtime because this is a Kubernetes conference. So we provide a Spark on Kubernetes. This is a Google open source project. We run, um, this is one of the supported runtime which we provide as part of the platform capability. Uh, the reason we are providing this is because uh, we are, uh, most of our services are in Kubernetes, so we want to actually provide this Spark runtime also in, uh, in a Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, it actually, it's a simpler, more homogeneous uh, because everything is dockerized. And it's very cost effective, right? It doesn't, uh, there is no vendor uh, lock-in or there is no surcharge. And uh, it's a shared resources and shared OPEX, so very cost effective. Our developers love using this. And uh, it's very declarative infrastructure. With that, I will hand it over to Rakesh to do a platform architecture deep dive. Right. Okay. Um, thank you, Ro. Um, hope I'm audible. Um, so next, we'll talk about the, uh, the platform architecture and um, go over on the high level um, how we have built the platform. Before we uh, get there, let's talk a little bit about the um, Intuit's data processing flow uh, from a very high level. Um, on the left, we can see a um, high-level overview of a simple um, data processing use case. Um, so the top layer has um, some Intuit customer products um, which are emitting data. Um, these could be clickstream data. Um, these could be data that we would like to post-process, uh, do data enrichment to. Um, so before the data arrives in our um, data lake, um, there are stream transformations um, done through our um, stream pipelines. And um, so there is a bunch of post-processing layers um, uh, where we do uh, post-processing and uh, uh, analysis. So from um, this layer, uh, we are able to uh, derive real-time recommendations, uh, data enrichment, um, feature generation, model training, uh, data curation, uh, fraud detection, and a bunch of other um, capabilities. So we will uh, look a little bit more into um, how uh, we are providing uh, the capability to build the DAG um, in the coming slide. So in this slide, we'll talk about the, uh, the architecture. So as we went over earlier, um, so batch processing's aim is to um, simplify um, uh, the use cases for a lot of personas. 
um, uh, being it like ML engineers, um, data analysts, uh, data engineers. And uh, we do that um, through uh, providing a simplified um, development, deployment, management, and orchestration and monitoring as uh, one holistic solution um, to um, both engineering teams and also to the platforms to integrate. So the high-level architecture uh, broadly has two sections. Uh, as can be seen at the top, there is a control, control plane layer, and at the bottom, there is a compute plane layer. Um, so in the control plane, um, we have the service layer, um, which helps with um, <coughs> um, the, the uh, creation of uh, the user's um, code repositories, their build environments, uh, their artifactory, and also uh, hookups to uh, observability. So this is a fully automated uh, self so process uh, that we have um, through our other paved road ecosystem um, called Modern SaaS, um, which is um, fully uh, running on uh, Kubernetes. And we have a job orchestration service um, for helping with the scheduling and orchestration of your pipeline. So um, we'll talk about the, the orchestration types in the next slide. And we have namespace service for uh, multi-cluster uh, Kubernetes namespace management and also for um, Argo uh, workflow uh, deployments and notification service for uh, providing um, alerting capabilities on the data pipeline. So um, let's talk about like what we perceive as a data pipeline and uh, what a data processor is um, to um, set the context for the, uh, the next part of the, the slides. So on the right, we have a data pipeline representation. Um, so in the previous slide, we saw a stream data, a stream data pipeline and a batch data pipeline, um, but the abstracts are very uh, similar between the two. Um, a data pipeline is a compute um, uh, and an orchestration layer, uh, which is a representation of one end-to-end -end, um, data processing job. And processors um, are a code artifact uh, that runs in the data pipeline um, to do data transformations. Um, that can be um, data enrichment, curation, um, uh, uh, training your model, feature generation, a lot of that. Like, I mean, there is a lot of data process that happens before um, the data um, is usable. So all that um, can be abstracted. And these are uh, processes um, uh, which are shareable. Um, so for example, um, a, da a data usually that um, uh, needs uh, an enrichment or curation, these can be shared built, uh, between multiple different um, data jobs. And uh, so that's one of the reasons why we abstract that into a separate unit by itself. And uh, we make the uh, processor as a shareable entity that can be added to any of your compute infrastructure, which being the uh, pipeline. Um, so there are varying use cases um, running um, today in the batch processing um, platform, uh, be it platform use cases. We have feature management platform running to generate features in a scheduled time frame um, using our Spark on Kubernetes layer. Um, we have ML platform using us for their workflow orchestrations and data scientists and other data personas directly interacting um, with the uh, UI for running their uh, SQL queries uh, to generate reports. <coughs> so the next slide will, uh, uh, in the, uh, we'll talk about the uh, uh, how we are uh, providing the capability uh, to build DAG and how we uh, provide dependency uh, management. So the main um, problem with the, like uh, that's there with like um, a lot of data engineering teams and platforms is how do we uh, make sure um, uh, data pipelines are uh, decoupled and also um, uh, data availability um, can be um, uh, uh, made made sure from one data pipeline to another. So in an organization, like you could have um, uh, pipelines and jobs that are not under your control, but you rely on the data. Um, so through the abstract, uh, uh, such as the data pipeline, we are able to um, make sure that like the, uh, the dependency DAG can be built on uh, upstream data sources. Um, each data pipeline for BPP translates into an Argo workflow, and uh, each pipeline could have two types of dependencies. Um, so we support a cron-based dependency through um, Argo cron workflows, and a trigger-based dependency uh, through um, Argo events capability uh, for a complicated DAG mechanics. So in this example, um, the root node um, are pipelines that have time-based dependencies, that, so that's starting up on a specific um, calendar schedule, um, and that's defined through the cron workflows, and all the downstream dependencies um, that are waiting on the root uh, node uh, are waiting uh, using the, um, the Argo event source and the Argo sensors. So each of these workflows uh, run in our orchestration compute plane that we went over earlier, and uh, the workflows are um, decoupled from our runtime compute layer. So like Arup went over earlier, so we do support multiple different runtime computes based on the use cases, um, be it like Spark on Kubernetes, or if you're interested in running in Databricks or EMR based on your um, data processing need. Um, so you can the workflow on a uh, 
the, uh, the, the runtime of your choice. So in the next slides, we'll um, talk about the operational excellence and the observability capabilities and the journey that we went through uh, in the past year to uh, make sure that we are able to um, get top of the line um, availability and also the SLA numbers. So with the, pay, uh, with the help of the paved road ecosystems within Intuit, uh, we get a lot of observability features um, for, from our paid path um, uh, Kubernetes platform, uh, which is called Mountain Sash, uh, which provides uh, advanced GitOps and uh, Kubernetes control plane and observability. Um, so deploying of a new uh, cluster and managing the cluster and also the observability of the cluster um, is uh, handled by uh, different paid path teams within the team which we interact with, which we built the platform on top of. Um, as a platform, um, uh, providing distributed compute infrastructure as a service to Intuit, um, there are several uh, operational challenges when it comes to managing uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters. So right now in our production, we um, run um, four uh, Kubernetes clusters, two for our uh, orchestrations and uh, two for our um, uh, runtime. Um, so we tackled um, uh, improving the operational excellence to uh, op optimizing on two areas. One is uh, platform operational excellence um, and the other is uh, providing um, developer and customer operational excellence. So when it comes to platform operational excellence, uh, we took several steps to improve our confidence and visibility into the health and reliability of this uh, platform and the infrastructure. Um, starting from tightening the OpMIC process within the team uh, for building um, cross-service expertise and confidence through uh, unified operational monitoring and uh, continuous improvements uh, by uh, monitoring the MTTD and MTTR quarter over quarter uh, and also constantly tackling stability and scalability as P0 uh, for the platform. So um, through this journey, um, what we did um, is uh, we uh, were able to scale um, uh, to uh, thousands of concurrent workflow runs and we are able to provide four nines of availability and um, less than one minute uh, job deployment guarantee. So let's talk about the one minute job deployment guarantee. So um, one minute um, is the, the time that we guarantee uh, for uh, provisioning and deploying your entire um, uh, data pipeline infrastructure and get it to a uh, running stage. Um, so once the provisioning happens, your data pipeline can run for hours, but the time uh, between you fire the request and the time that we provision uh, through our uh, platform uh, uh, is one minute. So we achieved this uh, by decoupling our compute plane um, into orchestration compute plane and fine tuning uh, the Kubernetes clusters uh, for the specific um, uh, job that it's uh, given. Um, uh, in our um, in our orchestration compute clusters, uh, we have fine-tuned our um, IPs uh, to be uh, the warm pool in the uh, clusters to have high IP limit uh, for the pod provisioning, uh, pod provisioning times to be very low so that they, we can support um, large amount of concurrent workflow deployments. Um, so, and also uh, we have built a solutioning on um, uh, multi-cluster um, workflow deployment, um, which we will be uh, coming out uh, with a better solution uh, together with the Argo team, uh, uh, with Argo open source team. So the next aspect is the developer operation excellence. So um, as a platform, so we, uh, we have to monitor our SLAs and monitor our availability, uh, but also to uh, provide um, operational excellence capabilities um, to the users that are interacting with the platform. We have a pipeline health metrics to track um, the status and health of your pipeline, um, notification integration for monitoring your data pipeline into uh, SLA and also failure alerting, um, auto scaling and also uh, pipeline retries uh, for uh, more, more fault tolerance. So next we'll um, uh, take a look at the, uh, the platform demo. So uh, there is a more extensive demo coming up, but to start with, um, so uh, we wanted to start showing like the, uh, the capability internally that we have built for a fully automated a processor and a pipeline deployment experience. So here we can see that like uh, for, uh, we have an Intuit a developer portal experience where users could uh, create a data processor uh, by providing their runtime in this example, Spark, uh, their language of their choice, uh, and a bunch of other default Spark configuration because this is a Spark uh, data processing application. So we right out of the box, spin up the, uh, the GitHub repository, the build environment, uh, the Argo CD uh, for orchestrating uh, your builds and also uh, hookups to the uh, observability um, so the developers can focus on the code and not on the process of getting your uh, thing up and running. So this has severely ac accelerated um, the uh, amount of time uh, anyone can get to production. And then once you
Auster. So like, it, like we discussed earlier, the Froster being the code artifact that can be shared between multiple compute. So you can now create your um, data pipeline, which is the computer and orchestration layer where you will be able to pick your compute of your choice. Um, for example, um, the, the Spark on Kubernetes, uh, to pick the Kubernetes cluster, it's getting deployed to, uh, we auto provision a namespace uh, with the required um, IAM roles. We also have a, a Kubernetes uh, a control plane uh, that is built by Intuit uh, so users can uh, configure their policies on access to the data, uh, and we also uh, provide abilities to add your processors. You can stack uh, st a lot of processors into a single pipeline and create your orchestration. In the next, use the processor and the pipeline, um, you could create your um, scheduling. Um, so like we discussed, you could either do a cron scheduling if you want your uh, processor to run on a uh, defined schedule, or you could create a dependency-based schedule where your processor depends on an upstream data pipeline. On completion of an upstream data pipeline, your processor will automatically uh, trigger. This provides the decoupling between um, data layers uh, for improved efficiency on tracking the data availability um, between uh, data organizations. So next slide, uh, we have a pre-recorded demo of our execution uh, which we'll play. Um, which shows um, how all the things that we talked about comes together. In this platform demo, we are going to look at data pipeline running on Spark on Kubernetes and look at all the standardized capabilities that is provided out of the box by the platform for a developer in the ecosystem. What we are seeing here is Intuit's developer portal experience where data engineers can configure their data pipelines and data processors. This Spark on Kubernetes data pipeline has been configured to run on the given Kubernetes namespace and the cluster, which are configured during the initial pipeline provisioning phase. As can be seen, the data pipeline has a processor, a schedule, and some additional configurations. Let's take a look at the processor. A processor is a code artifact with a standardized GitOps process provisioned by BPP and modern SaaS during the fully self-serve processor creation experience. The developer gets a code repository and CI/CD built out of the box with integration to Artifact Tree. Besides the processor, user also gets access to into its Kubernetes Service Manager or IKSM. IKSM is a control plane for managing Kubernetes cluster and namespaces. Here we are looking at the developer's configured namespace where they have the ability to manage the namespace resources and ACLs. Besides, developers also get access to different metrics and dashboards for monitoring their pipeline. This is a sample dashboard that comes out of the box that is customizable by the developer based on their needs on their monitoring. Besides, Splunk dashboards are also pro provided out of the box for monitoring pipeline runs and execution history are available for better traceability. Developers and teams also get a quick costing view and additional costing dashboards for managing cost on the pipeline. Additionally, Spark History server is provided where the Spark runs can be looked at. Let's now execute the pipeline and see how that works. Here I'm going to execute this pipeline twice. An execution of the pipeline can be done um, in an ad hoc fashion like we just did or can be based on the schedule or an upstream dependency. Each execution creates an Argo workflow, which we'll just take a look at, which will orchestrate the steps uh, required for running this data pipeline. So here there are two running workflows. Let's take a look at one of the workflows. So each workflow creates the Spark application. So here I'm pulling up like all the running um, Spark application. So as can be seen, there are two running Spark apps which are being monitored by the workflow the workflow besides firing the Spark application on the customer's namespace also monitors the Spark app and then emits an event to Kafka, which is then uh, read by the orchestration service for updating the pipeline state. If we go back to the pipeline UI, we can see that the state of the pipeline is currently running and the execution has been updated. In the execution, you can take a look at um, the configuration using with the execution fire and also other execution logs, which are readily available for the users to 
look at running executions. I think um, that's, uh, that's in this platform demo. We are going. Next slide will, um, yes, that's all with the presentation. Now we'll uh, have time for the Q and A. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what a great talk, yeah, and, and good to see demo at the end as well. Um, questions from the audience? Again, raise raise your hands, and I'll come round. Don't don't all jump at once. There we go. Yep. Hello. What if uh, your clusters don't have enough resources to run all the, the jobs uh, your users have? Do you have any uh, stack for that? So we um, have um, cluster monitoring uh, based on our um, capacity. So we are able to load balance um, both our um, Spark application and also our workflows to uh, multiple uh, Kubernetes clusters. So, um, so usually when uh, we are getting close to a capacity, uh, so we uh, provision new clusters. Um, so the main aspect of this um, is having the ability to monitor, manage multiple clusters and load balance the load um, both on the uh, orchestration and also the, um, the Spark job, so which we have. So we have the ability to add no, more and more clusters as we scale. So right now we are running on four production uh, Kubernetes clusters, but we'll scale up as um, there are more pipelines that are getting onboarded. Um, other questions? How ex extensible is the uh, scheduling capability on the platform side, right? So for the Spark jobs, could you use external schedulers like Unicorn, or, or is it using a standard Kubernetes scheduler? Um, scheduling on the Spark jobs? Yeah. So for scheduling, um, we fully use Argo. Um, yeah. So Argo provides um, um, uh, the Argo events and Argo workflows, so which we use for both the scheduling and the orchestration. Uh, and the jobs are deployed um, so the scheduling is outside of um, Spark jobs. I see, I see. Okay. Also so maybe would I can it, add would a it be bit, able uh, to do uh, things like gang scheduling? We do scheduling. have a lot of workload which is still running on EMR. I so see. we want to actually do the dependency management between these two jobs. So it needs to be outside of the Spark. Yeah. Uh, so that is the reason we actually build a scheduling and orchestration layer outside the Spark runtime layer. I see, gotcha, thank you. I'm kind of curious when you when you have a one minute job SLA. I'm assuming you run on AWS, you said I am, and some other stuff. Do you just pre-provision nodes or have some pre-scheduling so that pods can actually go onto nodes, or is it the pods are created and the cluster auto scaler is going to kick in? So the um, the pods uh, are not pre-provisioned. So the the nodes are um, dedicated um, for. So we, since we have a dedicated clusters for our provisioning, I mean, and scheduling layer. So um, those clusters are highly available, and on top of that, um, we um, pre-provision the IPs required uh, for bringing up a pod. That has been our throttling point, which we noticed when we were doing our um, load testing and uh, when we are trying to provision thousands of pods, um, pods were taking um, six minutes and 12 minutes. So the optimization strategy uh, for us was um, providing each nodes um, in the uh, I uh, Kubernetes cluster um, more, uh, pre-warmed IPs so that it can provision. Um, so the resource never was the issue. It was always IP limitations uh, that has been enforced in this case by the cloud provider AWS on the EKS, which we run on. Great, um, any final questions? Okay, well, um, yeah, thanks again, Arup and um, Rakesh, and let's have, give them a round of applause. Thank you.